is BBC Two. Now, lock the door. The horror film audience wants to be uh, taken on a ride, a joy ride. And maybe it's a very cathartic and healing process for them to be brought to, to face their fears and then be able to leave the theater unharmed. They, in a way, have uh, faced the dragon and uh, can live to face a greater dragon in the future. I think we've probably been telling horror stories to each other as long as we've been speaking. Uh, you know, sitting around the fire wondering what all that was up there. We are the only critter on this planet that knows we're going to die. And uh, isn't it nice to sort of make up some possibility of what might be out there after that happens? The audience, the demographic for movies like this is generally young men between the ages of 15 and 25. And I started thinking, those are the young men that usually get sent off to war. Those are the young men that usually get put right in the front line and told to, are told to march into the enemy gunfire. They think they're immortal. That's why they can put them in the uniforms and ship them out to, uh, to fight wars. I think that in certain horror films, when they're, when they're done well, um, are fairy tales, uh, and they, which is to say that on some mythic level, you take one of your darkest fears, and in most horror films, it's, it's the fear of, of uh, untimely death. And I think that all of us, when we are that, that age, have this sort of morbid fear about this, and you can't quite talk about it or get it out, but you can act it out in films. So by taking it out in the open and showing it, it becomes less scary. <laughs> We go to horror movies to see the villain at work. We go to see Dracula, we don't go to see Van Helsing, yeah? Uh, and at the same time as wishing him to be depraved, demanding that he be depraved, uh, being entertained by his depravities, we are at the same time watching in the full and certain knowledge that he will be dispatched. The devil is allowed to play all his best tunes, and we can dance to them for a while, and then know that the pipe will be put down, and that good will come in, and we'll be led out to a clean white dawn. One of the most appealing things about horror films, and why they're so upsetting to adults, um, is because for the audience that they're intended for, that is young people, those, uh, that group of people uh, are looking for the truth. They're just entering adult life. They've been told a lot of distorted things by adults and teachers and authorities, and they're trying to find out what are the, what's the real facts. No, 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 please, no, no, no. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> In that sense, they're dangerous films. The truth is always dangerous, especially to the authority and establishment, and they'll try to censor it. I think if there's any reason that horror has survived and flourished over the decades, it's because violence has escalated during those decades. And horror films provide a sort of a, an escape hatch, which we don't get from real life. Everyone tends to have the same mythological images in their heads. All over the world you have um, vampire stories and you have um, people who don't reflect in mirrors or who cast their images out separately from themselves or who, you know, look like they're coming towards you and they're really creeping up behind you and things. But it's amazing how everyone has the same stories. There are very few things nowadays um, that can actually give us that thrill anymore um, to set our pulses racing. So they're, they're seeking um, that part of their natures that 
needs something more. The thrill of the chase, the, um, the feeling of being essentially alive, and a good scare makes you feel that way. Other than sex, it's the only thing that really makes you feel that way. G going to a horror film, especially a good horror film, or any thriller or suspense film, Hitchcock or something, it places you in a jeopardy situation without really being in jeopardy. It's very much like a thrill ride, like a roller coaster at an amusement park, where you get on a ride to be frightened, to have that moment when the roller coaster just goes over the edge like that, and you have no control. And for me, the scary part of a roller coaster and a horror movie is not the ride down, is not the, the scare, the dip. To me, the horror part is going up the hill to get to it. It's not about how much blood you shed. It's about setting it up. It's about being, it's not really what's behind that door. It's being just afraid of what's behind that door. because there's all different kinds of suspense. There's a scene where a man, let's, I'm making this up, a man is, puts a gun in someone's mouth. Now, if it's a Russ Meyer movie <laughs> or someone, we know who's telling the joke and we're going, oh gosh, I don't want to see her brains come out her nose. Oh, like that, you know. But if it's a Hitchcock movie, we know who's telling the joke and we're thinking, oh my God, we have all this intellectual information and all this emotional stuff that's going on with this poor character in Jeopardy and oh my God, we don't want her to be killed. And you're getting, Equal anxiety, but for very different reasons. The scarier movies are the ones. You ever see The Haunting? Not a makeup effect, not a monster, but it scared the shit out of you, didn't it? I mean, and because of how the roller coaster ride going up the hill was presented, you know? What you What were you pounding? The walls. I mean, I did. But now it's down near the other end of the hole. The Haunting, Robert Wise's movie, is just what you don't see. And what you hear, he played with sound a lot, and just cre it was just creepy. In all movies, you've got a creature you don't show people, and um, the haunting never bothers to actually show you the creature, or at least implies that the house itself is the creature. There's a James Whale movie called The Old Dark House, which I find, with, a, with a, just a fabulously eccentric and funny performance by Ernest Thesiger and Charles Lawton and Melvin Douglas, and Karloff is frightening in it. As a child, as six years old, The Old Dark House, which I saw on TV recently, and it wasn't half as good, naturally, but as a five, six-year-old kid, the effect of me was tremendous. Rosemary's Baby, I think, would be one of my favorites. It's, it's what's gonna happen, those bumps in the night. It's a really scary movie. I think the first horror film that I, I saw that I really, really liked and had a lot of fun with was Night of the Living Dead. It was funny, it was scary, and um, it was different. The first Night of the Living Dead is, is a wonderful film. It was Night of the Living Dead specifically that I had seen as a kid, and it so terrified me, I just admired its ability to, to wrench me into a terrible knot of fear. I love The Exorcist. I think that The Exorcist was a real landmark picture. I, I guess The Exorcist probably affected me the most as a real, you know, under your skin horror film. The Thing, you know, Kristen Nyby and Howard Hawks made this really scary movie. The Thing. The Howard Hawks Thing. The one that I esteem probably above all others is a French film made in 1955, I believe, by Henri-Georges Clouseau, Les Diaboliques, and it was a terrifying film done in black and white. To me, the scariest movie was The Tenant by Roman Polanski, because he messed with your head. He was saying, no, what you're seeing isn't what you're seeing, and what you're thinking is wrong. As a teenager, the one that made the most impression was um, Psycho. Beyond doubt, that was the one that changed everything for me. My favorite horror movie of all time is Psycho. I could watch that once a week and find new levels of entertainment in the film. Frankenstein, I mean, I'll never forget as a kid, six years old, being scared to death of that creature. 
I would go back to James Whale and The Bride of Frankenstein, which I consider to be the greatest horror movie ever made. Here is a movie which manages to be very droll and dark, scary, romantic, ridiculous, spectacular. <laughs> such affection for some of the old ones that I don't think anything's equaled it. I mean, it's sort of like going to church to watch Dracula. It's like looking at a wonderful old house that'll never be built again because you don't have time to, like, deal with each one of those stones. Remember the 1950s. Hula hoops, rock and roll, Doris Day, canasta, alien commie body snatchers. Ah, happy days. And made all the happier by those merry fellows at EC Comics who produced the original Vault of Horror and created quite a stir. The next time, young man, I find you with a worthless piece of shit like this again, you won't sit down for a week, buddy boy. Remember that. <laughs> My memories of EC are, are very fond. I mean, those days when I was in the theaters looking at the thing and waiting eagerly for e every issue of, of one of the EC horror mags to come out. I loved those comic books. I just loved them. I love the EC comic books of the 50s, although I've only read the reprints I thought were very funny and uh, really wildly grotesque and unusual for their time period. One that, that really stands out in my mind is uh, some villain, some bad guy, wound up with his head through a carnival uh, wall, and someone was throwing hardball baseballs at his head. And, and they were very graphic to show the skin flailing off, you know. And as a child, that really, it was very gross to me and, and very scary. In fact, I remember reading those like under my covers in the bed with a flashlight at night and having to, being afraid that I would dream about these things, you know. work uh, at EC in the latter part of uh, 48 to 49. Somebody recommended me to Bill Gaines. They were doing adventure, science fiction, romance, and uh, he was just starting to dabble, I think, with the, uh, with the horror stuff. But the, the horror books began to move very well for him. William Gaines uh, aided and abetted. He uh, didn't create as much as he gave us the freedom, uh, the license, or the loss and the, to commit anything that we wanted to do. There were no rules. Um, we brought it in the job and delivered it, and, um, and, and we were like little lapdogs waiting for Bill Gaines to, to uh, giggle. If he giggled and laughed and, and screamed, we knew we had done a successful job. One of the uh, stories I uh, remember especially uh, was a vampire restaurant. And it ended uh, with the only diner. Uh, and when looking around in this um, restaurant that was walled with mirrors, he could only see himself. And, but it was a crowded restaurant, so he knew he was surrounded. He was um, hoisted upside down and, and uh, tapped like a keg of beer. I think I was the first guy to draw it in comics, a terrific um, uh, throwing up uh, panel, you know, with a guy, he thought he'd eaten uh, tomato soup and he found out it was warm blood. He was throwing it up. I sit in front of the mirror and got, got that heaving look until I got it right on the paper, you know. They stepped over the line, you know, they were always going that extra inch out to be outrageous or to be a little gorier. It was a Dr. Frederick Wortham, pretty much a quack, and uh, he wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocents saying that uh, it was a great cause of juvenile delinquency and uh, got a lot of publicity and then finally it wound up as a, a senatorial investigation by the United States. The one that got me into there, it's the father was uh, an alcoholic, the mother was having an affair with another man and she had the preference for living with a, an old maid aunt. She devised a plot where she actually shot the father 
took the gun, placed it in her mother's hand so it would have the fingerprints on it while she was... Uh, but the big objection to the uh, Senate Committee on Juvenile Delinquency was the fact that uh, the children were seeing this in a, in a bare art technique, going from panel to panel, uh, pretty much uh, explaining it in a way that it was uh, sort of a blueprint for murder, sadism, you name it. I always spoke to it was a... Uh, Steve said, no, the way to do anthology, he said, what did we all grow up on is EC. The way to do an anthology is to do you know, a comic book. I believe it was George Romero who said, gee, it would be great if we could get one of the old EC guys to set the frame and then have it dissolve into the actual movie. And Stephen King said, yeah, that, I like that idea. Next morning, he showed up with a little outline and he said, it's called Creep Show. And I have these couple of stories that I've already written as short stories, and I have, and I'll, within a few couple of weeks, I'll have ideas for some others, and that's how it happened. I told you before, I didn't want you to read this crap. <laughs>